Hello, mm -hmm. gamers. I am back, finally. I know it's been a very long time. We've got a new set. Why it's still here, though. I am, of course, your gold trans am, your lesbian gateway drug, Cuddlepunk, a.k.a. Veronica Vex. I am here with somebody who I've been watching for such a long time. He is a comedy musician. He is the creator of Some Trick with a Camera on YouTube. He is the creator and host of the Escape from Vault Disney podcast and just all around. Seems like a very, very cool individual. Tony Goldmark is here. Tony, how you doing? Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So I would say that you're probably best known at this point for either the podcast or from your now former web series, Some Trick with a Camera. Um, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> I was listening to uh, the Country Bears Escape of Vault Disney episode that you <laughs> did to like get an idea of your background uh, right, a little right. bit more on the thing. You started off on like the um, on the That Guy with the Glasses forums. Um, you had started when you had started your friend Charlie, aka Theme Snark. He had already uh, started um, his theme park review content. Uh, yeah, was your yeah, when you're when you saw that Charlie had done that, uh, was your first instinct uh, that this was somebody that you could learn from, or were you more worried that you had like stepped on somebody's toes a little bit? It, I, I wasn't really worried about stepping on his toes because, uh, when I found out he did that video, I noticed he also did all sorts of other videos about various types of content. So, okay, this guy's just sort of a, a potpourri content kind of guy. He does videos about all sorts of things and theme parks is just one of his very many interests. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I didn't see us as competitors really, but I did really enjoy his videos and I thought, mm, seems like a cool guy to collaborate with. And also, you know, I, I mean, the way you phrased it just there kind of makes it sound like, oh, he'd been doing this for years. I think his theme park video came out maybe six months a year tops before my first ones i think i'm older than him so he, he wasn't this like wizened mentor or anything but uh but totally. he seemed but he seemed like a really cool guy to collaborate with and that assumption proved very much true and uh he's still a very good friend of this day that's awesome that's really great to hear i always love hearing him and daily on the podcast whenever <laughs> they show up oh they're great uh, they're great so i became a theme park nerd because of your stuff i had never really I'm not a huge yeah i am not a huge roller coaster person that's mostly what i thought of theme parks as for the most part and it wasn't until i saw your stuff and stuff from uh charlie theme snark or doggins or trickster bell that i really started thinking of theme park attractions as art i was wondering if you by chance remember what was the first theme park attraction that made you see them as an art form hmm that's a good question i uh I, first of all i apologize for getting you into such an expensive art form <laughs> and especially such an increasingly expensive hey, art form my brother Disney... works at universal Ho my brother works at universal hollywood now i can get him when i need to <laughs> Well, I, uh, Charlie and Haley work there too, so I can get in when I need to, but Disney has just gone berserk with their prices lately. Here's how bad it is. I can't afford an annual pass anymore. Really? That's how bad it is. I, I, I just got a three-day pass for a few days, so I've been back to the park. I've ridden, um, I, I've ridden Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway now, and I love it. I still haven't gotten a chance to ride Web Slingers. That was, that was bad timing on that, but... Um, uh, but yeah, it's well, well, it's it's I'm, actually it's not so much that I can't afford it. It's just it's that I keep missing windows when they're available or That's at least fair. when the cheap ones are available because they only make them av available for very you know brief windows. It's very frustrating. I remember you saying um, on the Country Bears episode that the you started some jerk because of like you had got an annual pass when you first moved back to California. I'm also right. a I'm also a Columbia College Chicago alum. Oh, nice, well nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so you're used to overpaying for stuff, basically. <laughs> you and I are going to get it along just fine, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you had started it, like, because you had the annual pass and you had kind of started getting sick of Disneyland. Yeah, that was definitely one of the reasons. But to answer your question, um... I, you know, I wasn't a roller coaster kid when I was a kid. I was really afraid of thrill rides rather irrationally because when I finally, you know, it's, it's, it's like foods you think you don't like when you're a kid. When you finally try them, oh, this isn't bad. 
Uh, but but when I finally started trying thrill rides, I think Star Tours was my first big one. Uh, I said, oh, that was fun. And I kept progressing and progressing until ultimately uh, there's nothing at uh, there's nothing at the parks that I won't ride, except maybe it's a small world. But that's a whole other issue. But um, all of presidents. Oh, yeah. I, well, that's not <laughs> on the West Coast, fortunately. But yeah, that's a good point. The uh, uh, but as for the first one that made me realize it was an art form, I guess I wasn't really thinking about theme parks as art forms. I, I guess Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was the first ride that really made me laugh, uh, particularly at the bit at the end where you get hit by the train and you go to hell. Totally, like that. That was that was just the funniest damn thing to me when I was a kid, and uh, and uh, and and I guess. Um, so, so I, and I guess that's how you process art when you're a kid is 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 just through raw emotions like that. I guess the first ride I ever rode that really blew me away in that regard, that really made me go, oh my God, this is a masterpiece. This is my new favorite ride was the Indiana Jones adventure. Uh, every, when it's operating, when it's firing on all cylinders, because, you know, sometimes there's elements of the ride that, don't quite work right or, or something, but when everything's working right, it's absolutely perfect. I mean, the boulder at the end, I mean, I, I could go on for hours on how that's maybe the most perfect moment in any ride because it's one of the few times in any ride when it feels 100% real. Like the boulder looks like a real boulder. It looks and feels like it's really going to it's it's really going to roll down and crush you. It's, um you know, everything else, there's always... It's like the uncanny valley. Even if it looks really good, there's always that slight little, well, you know, they did the best they could, but but you know, and and I appreciate the artistic effort, but there's a little, you know, it's it's not quite real. The boulder in Indiana Jones, I partly because it's easy to make a fake boulder look real. Um because they're all just jagged edges anyway. Uh that's that just absolutely to this day blows me away. It, it's probably my favorite effect in any ride. That's awesome. So you <coughs> did, you're all good. So you did three seasons of Storm Drink with a Camera. And I then, did. And then in 2019, uh, you started Escape from Vault Disney, your podcast, which is an right. absolutely amazing podcast oh, that I <laughs> listen to all the time. Um, I imagine because I remember when you first launched it, you were still doing stuff like um, – like one movie laters or like theme park review videos. I remember the Star Wars Land video definitely came out around that time. Um, and then you, I, mean, obviously I, I, did. I think a couple months before the podcast yeah. launched, but yeah. And then you obviously still did the uh, Princess and the Frog video, um, but that might right, have been right. during the hiatus. Well, that was during the pandemic, so you know, right? What else was I going to totally. do? That's a great point. Um, I know that it's you have stated that you basically are focusing on the podcast entirely. I what am yeah. drove the decision to just stick to the podcast. I was afraid I was going to get asked that. Um, you know, partly I, I'm just not a fan of looking at myself on camera anymore. I'm not a fan of, you know, futzing with Adobe Premiere. You, you know, it, you get old, you get tired, you just kind of, you know, you want to spend less of your life just being angry at stuff, or at least I do. I mean, I, I don't know. A lot of people seem to get angrier as they grow older, but, you, you know, it's a wasted emotion. So you just, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's easier to crank out the podcast. I get to do it a lot more often. I get to put content out there. But of course, me still being me, I put a lot, a lot of effort into the podcast. It's, it's, it is basically a full-time job for me. And, you know, just because I'm very much a stickler for getting it just right in ways um, few podcasters are, you know, not to denigrate. There's certainly, uh, you know, there, I have nothing against the whole, oh, just record a conversation and release it unedited. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And they but, also have like a whole team of editors doing their stuff. Oh, it's mostly true, just true, you true. at this point. Yeah, I'm, I am my, I have a team of editors of one and, yep. and I, uh, and I just, uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing the podcast and it got to the point where I just stopped enjoying doing videos, you know, and if you're not, ha and I'm not making enough money to do stuff that I'm not having fun with as far as I'm concerned, you know? That's a really so. cool way to look at it. I think that's a perfectly reasonable answer. And I think <laughs> that 
truly people who keep begging you for season four are assholes. They're the biggest jerks in the world. You know, I get where it comes from. I get I get that it's just, oh, I love your work so much and I want to see more of it. And some people just don't like podcasts. That's perfectly valid. You know, they like YouTube shows. They like some jerk with a camera. They don't so much like just listening to stuff. And that's and that's fine, you know, but eh, I just don't have the energy to do the to do those kinds of videos anymore. And also, you know, just just from a financial standpoint, uh, I mean, season one was, you know, as I look back on it, I think there's a lot of good stuff in season one, but it's very amateurish. You know, I was shooting with a flip cam, for God's sake. I, I And it's not that I wasn't putting my all into it, but it was definitely it was more of a lark than the other two seasons were. By the time I did seasons two and three, I really upped my ambition a lot. Uh, for season three, I got a whole new camera with much better internal audio, which is why my sound suddenly sounded a lot better. And and also I was in a, I, I don't want to say exactly what happened, but uh, for those, la for seasons two and three, I was in a position where I could afford to not really have a day job, where I, I was in a fortunate enough position where I could basically just do some jerk full time, regardless of how much money I was being paid for it. And uh, and that's not the case anymore. It, it it's just you know that was then and this is now. What are you gonna do? Totally. That's I wish Weird Al was still putting out an album every three years, but you know he's decided to move on. He hasn't released an album in nine years now, and and it's really been and that, nothing that on the horizon. Came, so that album came out the summer I was going into sophomore year of high school. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, I mean, I mean, we'll t uh, but we'll talk about Weird Al a little we'll later on. We'll get on, to of we'll get to Al. We'll get to Al. <laughs> kind of like a little bit staying on the topic of like people who are asking you for um, like more not just some jerk, but more like the, of your video stuff in general. Um, I can imagine it can get pretty. It can be easy to get pretty cynical about like one movie, like some jerk or one movie later or the park vlogs. I was wondering specifically with the park vlogs and with one movie later, just to like make yourself feel better a little bit. Is there like a moment or an episode of each of those shows that you can point to as the ones that you're the most proud of? I would have to see a list in order to um, make my favorites really accurate. I guess for, well, I, I don't know if this really counts, but for one movie later, the kind of joke episode I did for cats because that won the Twitter poll and my intention from day one, ever since I launched that Twitter poll was okay. Cause it was right after the cats trailer had dropped. And I was like, right. Okay. If cats fucking wins, I'm not going to do a real episode. I'm just going to scream the whole time. It's just, and I'm going to have the guests scream the whole time. And it's going to be <laughs> that, that one was so fucking fun to do, but, it um, like a lot of but fun. it's not a real one movie later episode. It's a, it's a gag episode. Um, I, I, I quite enjoyed that I was able to do and that I actually did the parentheses 2019 trilogy because I just noticed that in the year 2019, there were three movies. Actually, if you count Disney Plus, four movies, because they also did release that Lady and the Tramp remake on Disney Plus's launch day, but they did Dumbo, Aladdin, and The Lion King, three movies all based on classic Disney animated films, all coming out this all coming out with remakes the same year. It was just bombarding us with them and not even bothering to change the title it's just the same damn it's it's meant to be the same damn movie but you know all three cases they just didn't live up to it at all and uh and, and yeah so so that was that was definitely fun to do as for park vlogs uh well i mean my favorite bit that i ever did for a park vlog was in the incredible coaster vlog uh at one point we're online for the incredible coaster and i'm just talking about something and some guy in the snaky line who's standing right behind me fucking goes like this in front of the camera and i was mid sentence and uh, on talking about something that i very much wanted to keep in the episode so i couldn't cut that out i couldn't crop him out i had no way of of taking him out so i was just like you know what fuck it you want to be on camera i'm putting you on camera and you can see exactly what i did there I, I i won't spoil it but on my channel, there's I, I made that segment its own video, which is called How I Deal with Photo Bombers. So just That'll search be in YouTube. the description of this video. Yes. Search YouTube for Tony Goldmark. How uh, just search Tony Goldmark Photo Bomber and you'll see what I did to that fucking asshole. Who went, 
on my fucking video. Like, it, yeah, I hate that shit. Okay, so that's my favorite segment in any park vlog. I guess right. overall, my favorite park vlog would probably be the Galaxy's Edge one. Um, I, I feel like that's probably the best edited of them all, all, and the one I had the most fun with in editing, especially a bit towards the beginning where I explain why I've disabled the comments on the video, which was also a lot of fun to make. I, I, I've done that like three or four times throughout Some Jerk is just making fun of old 50s educational films because it's just, they, those are just so much fun to make fun of. They're They're so ripe for it. <laughs> I've done them myself in, oh, yeah. uh, in like stuff for my videos. It's, it's so best. much fun to just do that voice. Like, you know, here, 1977, what year after that? Blah, 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 Dateline, you know? NBC. Date, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, was so, I was so excited to see that vlog specifically because I was living in Los Angeles for that whole summer and was able to experience uh, Galaxy's Edge, the uh, summer it opened. So that was- With like, very light was, crowds, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> Unless yeah, you were an annual really pass weird. holder, of course. It was Yeah, I would well, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> going I mean I I, I mean what what really sucks about um about how all that went down was that Rise of the Resistance wasn't ready. And Rise of the Resistance was the real piece de resistance of all of Galaxy's Edge. Like that is like Millennia uh, Smugglers runs pretty good. It, it's it's fine for what it is. But Rise of the Resistance was the real absolute masterpiece behind, you know, the, that was the reason to build a Star Wars land uh, in the first place, as far as I'm concerned. And it wasn't ready yet by the time summer 2019 rolled around. So, you know, people just people were only seeing an incomplete land, which you know, it was not unheard of. I mean, the same thing happened with Mickey's Toontown back in the 90s. Uh, Roger Rabbit cartoon spin didn't open till like a year later, but. Um, but still, it, it, that always sucks when that happens, because it's like, oh, the real reason you should be here isn't ready yet. What are you going to do? So one of the things that I've loved about Escape from Vault Disney is the show has kind of become something of a safe haven for what I like to call trans pop culture talkie people. <laughs> I've certainly noticed how many people like that have appeared on your show have been trans or even some people who have appeared in your stuff have come out uh, in the, like later on when the podcast has been going on. Sure. Um, sure. Has it become an intentional thing to want to platform trans or otherwise LGBTQ plus people, or is it still like, is this not like a pattern you've noticed and it's just been basically a massive coincidence? I wouldn't exactly call it a conscious effort to highlight LGBTQ voices, but, um, but, you know, I am very, I, I do, I am hopefully a, 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 a trans and LGBTQ ally. So, you know, I don't see any reason not to have them on. And especially, you know, the only people I would restrict from being on my podcast is uninteresting people, you know, people who would just don't have that charisma on mic and, I mean, I mean, you 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 probably know what I'm talking about. Although you yeah. you interview musicians and such, so so I'm guessing they all at least have some stage presence. But I would you know so. some. I I do have a couple of friends who you know I I I think the world of them, and and they've been very good friends to me. I've never had them on the podcast just because I don't think they have that. I I don't I just don't quite think they have that charisma about them, and it's nothing personal. It's just you know. Uh, it, it, it's just, I want my show to be as accessible as possible. And I want it to be as entertaining as possible to as broad an audience as possible. Um, but I'm, but I'm not going to appeal to bigots and say, you know, Oh, I'm not, I don't want trans people on there because, you know, people might, you know, threaten to tear down the target racks in my apartment. I don't know. It's, you know, I, I, I just think that shit's cowardly. And, uh, and I, and I thoroughly believe in trans rights and, you know, why not have your trans friends on if you got them? You know, it, it's uh, I can't think of any uninteresting trans people I know because uh, um, I, I, it comes with the territory a little bit. It, I won't it lie. Kind of does, yeah. <laughs> Which I think is why the right wing hates you, you folks, so much. Is, Trauma is does just, make you funnier. It's just a fact of life, and I'm sorry well, for I'm not sorry for saying. Well, no, that. I, but also uh, on you know from the the other flip side of that is 
conservatives are so desperate to be interesting. Have you noticed that? They, they are completely, thoroughly uninteresting people, and it kills them inside. They, they, they are jealous of how interesting you are. <laughs> that's the that's the quote from Tony Gildmar. Conservatives are jealous of how interesting trans people are. That's gonna they really, be that's, I, that's I, the tweet. I don't even mean that as a joke. I truly believe that, at least subconsciously, you know. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> Your content has gotten explicitly more political since 2016, since that first Hall of President State of the Parks. Um yep. with you're talking much more, not just about politics in general, but it's specifically the political and like more business sides of the Disney machine with especially specifically through the state of the parks bits on escape from vault Disney. Has it been harder to, you have basically completely associated your brand at this point with the Disney company. Has it been hard to like continue to associate yourself with that brand, particularly during the Chapek era? It uh, wasn't always easy, I'll tell you that. I, I know I've done a couple of segments uh, on my show after Disney does something especially heinous where I'm where I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I do this show. I'm sorry I, I tacitly promote Disney products. It's, it's, it's just kind of what I fell into. I, and I mean, even now, you know, Disney just fucking deleted all that goddamn content off Disney Plus for a tax write-off. It's the shittiest thing to do to the fans. It's, yeah, it, I, I hope it bites them in the ass the same way, you know, setting such a high price on Galactic Star Cruiser did. Um, I, I hope that content is all going to be available elsewhere someday, if not back on Disney Plus. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's always kind of the double edged sword you get to because, you know, I, I am still fascinated with Disney, I, I think is a good word. Uh, I don't love everything they do. I, 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 in fact, there are some years when I, I'd say I hate them more than I like them. But, um, but I don't know. You know, they they are just there. They are an omnipresent force in the universe. And, you know, I'm and if and if they do something I don't like, I'm gonna say I don't like it. I'm not gonna mince my words. I mean, last year when they. Uh, when they dragged their feet for so long about the fucking don't say gay bill. And there were those walkouts of the studio. I uh, put my show on hiatus for a week just cause I didn't want to. And I, and that whole week I didn't watch anything on Disney plus just because, you know, I didn't want, I, I didn't want to tacitly promote them in any way. And, uh, and, you know, and, and that's, and, and it gets me frustrated. Well, not frustrated. It's it, cause they're just idiots, but you know, like when people on Twitter see in my bio that I host a Disney podcast and they'll be like, oh, you're a Disney show. It, motherfucker, I I diss Disney more than you ever do. I it's, you know, but I mean, and, and I guess you could argue, you know, well, you know, making a podcast about how much Meet the Deedles sucks isn't exactly, you know, throwing bricks through their window. But, you know, I do what I can. And 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 you're right that my work has gotten a lot more political largely because just I've gotten more political. I mean, I started doing some jerk with a camera in 2011 during the Obama years when a lot of people like me, you know, just were naive enough to think, oh, we got a black president now. Everything's taken care of. You know, we we, we don't need anything else. And you know, like, I didn't even fucking vote in 2012 just because I, I, I hated Romney and I, I wasn't, I, and I was kind of disillusioned with Obama. And it took 2016 happening for me to realize, oh shit, you know, if you don't, if you don't fucking vote, you know, shit happens. And yeah, I mean, I think 2018 was the first midterms I ever voted in, you know, it's, uh, you know, so my content just is a reflection of me. So naturally, as I got more political, my stuff got more political. Totally makes sense. Um, this is our last question before we get into the bit. Um, it's about your music, which, for the record, I am a very big fan of. I listen to <laughs> Goldmark. After You're very Dark kind. At least I listen to it at least a couple of times a year. Like it is a <laughs> album that I continuously come back to. Um, That's the good one. Yes. <laughs> well, that's kind of what this has to do with. I have not listened to. I haven't listened to your first album, or well, we'll get into it in this question. You released sure. Goldmark After Dark back in 2015. 
And 2014, you had but who's counting? 2014, right. Uh, you had uh, recorded and released albums previous to that. I know you don't necessarily like to think of yourself as a comedy musician these days, but um, I wanted to know what the biggest difference is between um, making Goldmark After Dark versus making the album you made when uh, you were a kid that you talked about on a recent episode in like November. Well, let's um, let's bullet point the whole history of me uh, as a comedy musician, because because, uh, yeah, um, I've released an album roughly from from 1996 to 2014. I released an album, I'd say roughly every five years. Uh, the first one was just me. I recorded it literally when I was 12. My mom had connections. Uh, she knew some people with a with recording studios. She knew a bunch of musicians, and she just thought it'd be fun to record an album with her t precocious twelve year old son. I was basically Eugene Belcher when I was a kid. When when Bob's Belchers came on the air, Eugene Belcher's like, "Oh, that's me. That's fucking me. I feel so seen." Uh, well, that that's me as a kid, anyway. And uh, I was always trying to perform, but I was horrible at it. And uh, and that first album, you know, it, it has a certain youthful energy, I guess you could say. It has a certain precocious um, tween charm to it. It's not objectively very good, but, you know, I was 12. What are you going to do? But it got me my first ever Dr. Demento show airplay. Uh, one, of, one of the songs on there got played a couple times that year. And uh, and that kind of got me into the do and that combined with my weird Al fandom got me more and more into the Dr. Demento show. And I and so I really wanted to release more albums. My second album came out in 2001, arguably was even worse. Uh, and, uh, you know, just because we've gone from 12 year old energy to 17 year old energy. So the 17, you know, the 12 year old was just kind of fun. The 17 year old was a little more insufferable and wrote songs about fucking gunning down pop stars and shit i was such an By angry chance, disturbed young does man that album does that album contain the um uh it's a small world parody that you referenced <laughs> in your it's a small world review how'd you guess how'd you <laughs> fucking guess yeah that, 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 i've been watching you for a long time and i obsess over everything that i care about i apologize that small world parody is indeed on the on the album i recorded as a teenager um that album's not very good either, but you know, it, in fact, one of my most diehard fans, I won't say who, but one of my most diehard fans actually managed to track down a copy of that album and reviewed it on his blog and said, oof, I love him, but oh, this album's bad. And, uh, and I can't disagree with him. A few years later, I released my third album, uh, which was, which was, which contained most of my biggest Dr. Demento show hits. Uh, that album was called Rage Against the Mundane. That one is actually available uh, to stream on Spotify and iTunes if you're interested. It's not it's not that much better than than my first two, but it has its moments, definitely. That's the album where my, uh, probably my biggest hit song so far, the Sir Mix-a-Lot uh, parody of Baby Got Back called Serious Black about... Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. It was 2004. No one knew yet. I'm sorry. I but... was going to say, it. Uh, one other reason why you may want to do a season four is because your final episode was on The Wizarding World of Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that was, you know what? Just pretend that doesn't exist and pretend the Haunted just Mansion pretend... three parter. Just pretend right. my escape from Vol uh, pretend my escape from tomorrow episode was my final episode because it feels more like a final episode. Anyway. I was gonna say exactly, yeah. So, yeah, but uh, but anyway, so um, so so that's where Sirius Black came from. That's where uh my another big Doctor Demento show hit for me a song, a style parody of the band Creed called Teeth Clenched about how the guy sang like i got my teeth clenched and i'm walking in the rain and it was it, it, it was just a song about how fucking lame creed was and uh and it got a lot of dr demento show attention i think that was the number the third most requested song of 2003 serious black was the number two most requested song of 2004 and um and then shortly after that uh 
I was I was good friends with Luke Ski at the time, and I and I am now. But there was a period in there where I had a really stupid falling out with him for stupid reasons that we don't need to go into. I eventually patched things up, and we're very good friends today. But um, my uh, my fourth album that came out in two thousand nine, uh, you wouldn't even know it was my album because for re- for also very dumb reasons that I'd rather not go into. I decided to call myself Flying Like Wilma. We, and it, it, so so if you search iTunes or Spotify or anything for the band Flying Like Wilma, it's not really a band, it's just me. But, uh, and, and I put out one album under that name, uh, Learning to Read Made Me Cool. In fact, uh, in my step-by-step video, you'll probably remember there's a so- there's a montage set to this song. You know, learning to read, to made, read me cool. made me cool. Th- that's from that album. That's from the Flying Like Wilma album, and uh, and there's some good stuff on that album. I think uh, actually, pro- uh, also another thing you'll find on my YouTube channel, uh, the Scrooge McDuck song comes from that album. I, I even did a, a mini sode about that song a while back. And, I was listening um, to that. I was listening to that song at work one time, and <laughs> I genuinely, I genuinely had to turn it off because I was scared that they were going to notice that I had earbuds in. I was laughing so hard. Yeah, if um, uh, if you want to, uh, that's also on my YouTube channel. If you search Tony Goldmark Scrooge McDuck, you'll find that one. And uh, and and so that album, it, it, I thought it was pretty good, and. Uh, but eventually I, re- and then uh, Goldmark After Dark came out in 2014. And I do think with the possible exception of the album I recorded as a teenager, uh, I think every album has been, every album I put out has been better than the last. Uh, and, and, uh, but you know, uh, it just got to the point where I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, partly because I realized I really didn't like performing live. I really didn't, you know, I, I, I just hate making mistakes live and you're far more likely to make a mistake live. And if, if you make a mistake on camera or while recording a podcast, you know, I can always edit that out, you know, but live, you can't do that. And that really always bugged me. And I know it's just the nature of the beach uh, of the beast, but I just decided, well, I just, I just don't like that part of it anymore. And, and also uh, all five of the albums I described were recorded with massive, massive help from my parents. My parents are both musicians themselves. You know, I am, I guess you'd call a Nepo baby, technically. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, my, all five of my albums were either produced or co-produced by at least one of my parents. And it just got to the point where, you know, it, it's not even that I don't like making these albums. It's just that I, I, I think I've finally reached the age where I just want to make, I just don't want to make stuff with my parents anymore. I mean, especially on Goldmark After Dark, there were a lot of moments where, um, you know, my dad's always thinking like a musician and I'm always thinking like a comedian. And sometimes those two perspectives clash. Like on, uh, you know, the song Take Back America on Goldmark After Dark? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Towards the end of that song, there's background vocals, which are just me just doing, you know, and my dad hated those background vocals. He was like, you know, you know, we put so much effort into making the music on this song sound great. And then the background vocals just sound like fucking Muppets. You know, that's, uh, that was his perspective on it. And I was like, Oh, I think that's funny. And I, and ultimately it is my album. So I, I got to overrule you on that dad, but it's like, I don't know. I don't like fighting with my own dad that, you know, he's, he's a cool guy. And, you know, it, it just got to the point where, it wasn't like an, you know, it was kind of like doing some jerk with a camera. It wasn't an active, you know, oh, I'm never doing that again. It was more like, you know, time moved on and I moved on too. And, you know, if you're not enjoying something, why do it as far as I'm concerned? It's a great point. I can't imagine that your dad had a great time with raccoons if those background <laughs> vocals were mm. getting to him. I got to tell you about that song. So you're talking about the song Burn also on Goldmark After Dark. Right. So a rip- Originally, I had kind of devised the song Burn as a sort of They Might Be Giants style parody initially. I can see and that. I thought, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I thought, you know, da, 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 da. But, but, like they, but like if They Might Be Giants attempted surf rock, like, like I always, in my head, I always pictured John Linnell singing the lead vocals of that song. But I realized, but, but when we recorded it, 
um, I realized we were pitching the song at the wrong key. We were pitching the song at kind of a high pitched John Linnell key. And when I tried to sound like John Linnell, it really didn't sound good. And they were like, oh, you know, we we fucked up. We we recorded this at a key that uh, that Tony can't handle. And I was like, OK, how do we do this? Chipmunk vocals. That's how we do this. So and that's how I came up with the conceit of the, you know, cartoon raccoon platoon. And, and you know, so I had all these, you know, we could we could slow the song down, record my vocals at a lower key and then speed up the song. And it was and it's chipmunk vocals and it sounds fine. And uh, and it was the stupidest fucking idea, but I fucking love it. I mean, I, I, I can't say my dad really loved that either, but um, but, you know, ultimately my album. What are you going to do? Thank you so much for being here. This has been easily one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done. Uh, where oh, can people so find much. you? Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Tony Goldmark. You can also follow my podcast, Escape from Vault Disney, on Twitter at EFBD Podcast. I've got a Facebook fan group you can join called Some Jerk with a Fan Club. I've got a YouTube channel we mentioned earlier, youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark, where you can find all three seasons of my web of my defunct web series some jerk with a camera uh it's not defunct land it's just a defunct web series uh but uh, but it does cover theme parks i've also got a bunch of other videos about movies and theme parks and i and of course i have the podcast escape from vault disney where we review movies tv shows and short films available on disney plus chosen usually completely at random though sometimes we have themed episodes or guest choice episodes uh, we, we have a lot of fun on that podcast you can hear that on such outlets as Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever podcasts aren't sold. Uh, the most recent episode will be uh, an episode we covered on The Mandalorian, Season 1, Episode 3, The Sin. You can uh, That's our most recent episode. And, uh, and our next episode, I believe, will be on uh, an episode of the Nat Geo series, Alaska's Deadliest. So you and um, the fucking Nat Geos, Jesus! It's been more than two months. I had to let it. I had to let it go. I couldn't veto I get it. You. I'm sorry. I get you. <laughs> if you guys so, want a perfect encapsulation of what Tony's sense of humor is, there's two videos I think you should watch. One of them is called Bear Bees and Boy, and that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> and then the other okay. one is uh, the commentary that he did for his. Uh, uh, his uh, Some Jerk season one episode on Halloween at Disneyland. It is see, probably see, those my, favorite... my Those might be my most, my two most out there videos like that. Like, like it's, it's my sense of humor in the sense of it's what I find funny. I don't know if anyone else is going to find it funny, but, uh, but uh, those are probably my two weirdest videos. Definitely. That's why they're my favorites, man. You can find <laughs> awesome. me. You can find me uh, on social media at any of the links in the description. If you like this video, please leave a like. If you want to tell me who else I should interview, you leave a comment down below. And also, you know, make sure to hit the subscribe, hit the bell, everything that everybody else tells you to do. Tony Goldmark, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. This has been fantastic. Fantastic. My absolute pleasure.